Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Uva Brandis. I'm the executive director of the new uh, Masters of Professional Studies in Urban and Regional Planning here at, uh, here at Georgetown University. And uh, it is a great day. It is a really, really exciting uh, great day uh, to announce the creation of this new master's degree at Georgetown University. And we're doing it here at our new, uh, lots of new things here, new uh, downtown, Georgetown downtown campus <clears throat> in the heart of Washington, D.C. So we're extremely, extremely excited to be uh, debuting this, this degree program at Georgetown. Um, I came on over the summer uh, to lead it. And um, uh, we have uh, a wonderful, wonderful class of, of students who, who've started uh, this fall. Part, part of the process of, of creating the program here at Georgetown is really about connecting with uh, the local community, with local professionals, and the region as a whole. And what better way to do that than to invite uh, leaders from the region in uh, to share with us their thinking, um, their thoughts, and um, their views on very important urban planning issues here in the Washington, D.C. National Capital Region. And so with that, we kick off uh, this fall's speaker series, public speaker series. And um, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way to start uh, to host Steve Fuller, um, and Steve is the Dwight Shar Faculty Chair and University Professor uh, and the Director of the Center for Regional Analysis at George Mason University. Uh, Steve is an outspoken uh, scholar, uh, uh, someone that everyone turns to um, in matters of the regional economy. And uh, when we were planning this speaker series, I promise I had no idea that the federal government was going to shut down this week. <clears throat> um, and it's uncanny the timing that we have to have Steve here join us today because you can't turn on the radio, you can't turn on the news without people asking that core question that people always ask about Washington, D.C., and that is, to what extent is the region's economy dependent upon the federal government? And uh, I can think of no better person to, to help us kick this off. And um, I'm just delighted you could be here today, Steve. Welcome to, to Georgetown University. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> ah, there we are. <clears throat> so you didn't have to introduce me. Uh, well, thank you for, I'm rarely referred to as a scholar. I've been called lots of other things, but I appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, we have a lot to cover. This, what a wonderful program you've assembled here. Uh, nine chapters of a much longer story. So we're just going to talk about a little bit of it. I want to give you a little bit of background of, on the Washington area so you understand the role of the federal government. And, and, and just to, to get to fast forward to the end, which isn't the shutdown or, or the sequester. We can talk about those things if you want. They could take our whole 45 minutes. Um, my, my hypothesis that I offer, as you might be able to tell from the title I picked for this, is that the Washington area is at a pivot point in its economic focus, and that the slowly declining role of the federal government in the local economy is being replaced by a slowly expanding role of the private sector. Now, it's been going on for a long time. And it was stimulated by outsourcing by the federal government that picked up speed under the Reagan administration. It goes back to the 80s, early 80s. And we built a business space here, which can do federal work, but they can do other kinds of work. And that our human capital here are people that have brains and skills. It's not like Detroit that are, or, or other places where they build an economy on manufacturing, it's harder to have them learn other skills. An IT guy, can do IT for anybody. You may have to learn a few more tricks, but they, they, they don't have to learn enormously different skills. 
our, phys our physical capital is enormously adaptable too. These are not factories, these are office buildings. Look at this place. This was a, I'll call it an office building. It looks like an office building. And now it's a university space, totally different kinds of spaces and functions. We can convert our space very easily to fit the new economy. It isn't a federal economy or a private sector. And so I, I see in the forecasts that I, I look at and the ones I, I gin up every once in a while when I've had a couple glasses of wine, you know, sh sh show that we're really pointing towards this idea of becoming a global business center. Well, why shouldn't we? I mean, we have every language in the world spoken here. We have how many embassies and foreign consulates? 180 or 190? Don't know what the number is, but we have most of them from around the world. We have connectivity with the world, air connectivity, certainly fiber and, and satellite. We are, we were described as the capital of the free world for a long time, way back during the, the dark days of, of the Cold War. But clearly a very important city, so, um, uh, country, the, mo the largest economy. We won't be always, but for the next 20 years, we still may be the largest economy in the world, and it's a growing economy that the world depends on. It's a perfect place to have a headquarters, a regional headquarters, national headquarters, to have businesses that don't do federal work but need to be here because of the work that gets done here. They need to know what's happening. And, and so I, I, I see us moving that way. So let's, let's go to the beginning. I wanted to show you what we're talking about, or what I'm talking about, because we all have definitions, my, some sense of what the, the region looks like. It's 22 jurisdictions, I think. <clears throat> uh, the District of Columbia isn't quite in the center, but it's clearly the, the center. There are five counties in suburban Maryland. There are, I think, eight counties in northern Virginia and six independent cities. So this, 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 this is halfway to Richmond, maybe a little bit more. It's a long way down. Uh, that, that's, that's more than halfway. Warren County is more than halfway to Winchester. And then there's Jefferson County. That's, I usually leave them out. That's West Virginia. And now we've added two more jurisdictions. We have Culpeper, which actually is here. And then there's Rappahannock County. Two mo new counties have just been added. And these counties get added by the Census Bureau based on economic integration. And the, the, the uh, surrogate for that is commuting patterns. People live out there and they commute in here. Not, not to D.C. Increasingly, they just commute into Fairfax or maybe to, to Prince William. Um, it would be a much bigger region if Baltimore wasn't. Baltimore owns the rest of this, the Maryland stuff going up, their metro area, except for for, I guess it's here, St. Mary's County didn't belong to anybody because they, they're dispersed or they're, they're, they, they don't commute, either one. <coughs> um, we tried to trade for, for Howard County, future draft choice things, but we, they didn't, wouldn't go for that. Howard County and Anne Arundel County are bifurcated in a sense. So this breaks down, so we might want to think of this as a bigger region. Um, but that's when we talk about the region, that's what we talk about. Now, <clears throat> we, there are some characteristics that are interesting. Uh, these are factual, I think, at least they were earlier in the year. I checked them all out. So we're, we're described as a smart um, or, or the best educated workforce. This is measured by years completed in school for population 25 and old, older. I, I explain this by that we're slow learners. But we have a lot of school behind us. Uh, <clears throat> I used to think we, we had more workers per household than any other place, but I found out in checking the facts that we're third. There are the two metropolitan areas that have more workers per household are Miami and San Diego, and they have more Hispanic households with extended families. So if you have bigger households, you're likely to have more workers. We have small households, but you can, you can maybe see where I'm going. We're second in the, the uh, Minneapolis has a higher labor force participation rate, but everybody that's here works pretty much. And so if we're lower than somebody like Minneapolis, it gets to be somewhat of a demographic pattern because more older people have lower, lower uh, participation rates. And so when you put those together, we, we're number one in money. And, and this just, this, is, this isn't 
wealth, this is in earnings, different things. But this always confuses people. Whenever these rankings come out, Arling or Loudoun for years was number one in the country, Arlington, Fairfax number two and three, Montgomery five. We, we have six or seven of the top richest counties measured like this. And people call up from all over the world, why is this true? It's because we have more people working and they have better salaries. It isn't that we're all rich. But when you combine two-person incomes with, with professional salaries, you, you, how do you get to number one? $119,000 household income. So it isn't rich. I mean, it's not a bad income, but it, does, it isn't rich by, by individual standards in some other places. But we, we do have a lot of earning capa uh, capacity. We typically have the lowest unemployment rate, and that's sort of, if we're all working and earning money, that helps. Uh, we don't have the lowest unemployment rate the most recent month. And, and we, we flirt with being one or two or being tied with, with Minneapolis as well. But I think we're, we're really low, though. We're a couple points below the, the U.S. Number one for traffic congestion. And people you know, complain about this. And I say, well, this is a measure of our success. If we were all unemployed and not going to work, we wouldn't have any traffic congestion. Traffic congestion is not created by people looking for jobs. It's created by people going to jobs. And so, I mean, there's other reasons for this. And, and the principal reason, and it's a planning reason, is that we believe that mobility is a right. It should be in the Constitution. I can live where I want, I can work where I want, and I should be able to speed unencumbered from one place to the next. In New York, you don't drive to work in your own car, and you're certainly in the city. And now in D.C., increasingly, you don't drive to work. I mean, you walk to work or you take public transportation. We're going to see, and, and, and the history, you'll hear more about this next week, I suspect, but the history of Washington is that it's a city really that built, even though it's 200 and 10 years old or so, it, it's a city that really evolved around the automobile post-World War II. Most of the growth beyond the District of Columbia and Arlington, Alexandria, is post-war growth. Yeah, and you can say, yeah, ins and the Maryland side, inside the Beltway, it's older, and it was trolley car related more, more so, but not in Virginia. And so we, we, we became more like Los Angeles when we think about the spread of people than Philadelphia or Boston, certainly, or New York. But we're, as we grow and mature and become a, 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 a global business center, we're going to become more like them, more, more like older cities where we have employment clusters and mixed-use developments and the kinds of things that we find exciting, what we're seeing in the, the, the revitalization of Washington, D.C. We're number two in square footage of office space. It says what we do. We don't work in factories or warehouses. We work in offices. It's a, it says a lot about our economy. And finally, it's interesting. We're the fourth largest economy. This is GDP, kind of, we call it gross regional product. In terms of the value of our economy, it's, it's around $460 billion this year. It's a round number. <coughs> uh, Chicago is three. Los Angeles is two. New York is one. But what's different, that we, we don't rank fourth in population, we rank seventh. This is, it's an uneven balance. You can find other metropolitan areas that are five and six or six and seven. You know, there's, there's one increment, in, and it says a lot about where our workforce lives and where it doesn't live, and it adds to this congestion issue. We import more workers every day to work in the Washington metropolitan than any other metropolitan area. I should say that more, let me correct our percentage of workers that we import is higher than other places. It's only 4%. New York is 2. Atlanta is 2. Dallas is 1.8. We import a lot of workers, and we're going to become increasingly dependent on the ability to bring people in here from other places because we haven't been building enough housing for them to live here. So there's some really serious planning issues here. So what's the forecast? Well, we're going to continue growing, and of course these aren't these will never be exactly the right numbers, but, but this is you know, 30 years out, and I'm not going to be here, so you can't ask me to prove it. <laughs> but what, but look, look at the difference just in rate, even though this is not quite a fair comparison, between our population growth rate and our job growth rate. It raises a question, who's going to do the work? Now, I remind you, forecasts for employment 
are, are machine generated. They assume that we have the water, we have the transportation, we have the housing, we have the bodies this, and with the skills, the educated workers to do this work. This is a really big challenge. Look at the forecast on our economy. This says not only are we going to have the workers to do the work, they're going to have to be really smart. This differential between, between the number, the increase in jobs and the increase in, in uh, the, the real value, use that one, that's the inflation adjusted, says that we have to be more productive. We have to work smarter. It's going to be a different economy. It feeds into this that the economy we have today is just the starting point for the economy tomorrow. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on. <clears throat> this is, you know, this is impressionistic, but, you know, look back over a period of, of uh, 110 years, and clearly the District of Columbia was where it was. This is, this is where it was by 1950 when it peaked. It was something over 800,000 people. You can look it up, but it, it and then it, it dropped down, and, and, and it started moving up again. But, <clears throat> and, and, the suburbs were, were, were basically inside the Beltway on the Maryland side over here. There wasn't a whole, in, in Arlington and, and, and Alexandria, there wasn't much beyond that. Uh, Falls Church, which is really close in, was incorporated in 1946. So, <clears throat> as we moved away, you can understand what, what's going on. And the, the Maryland side, which is five counties, and the Northern Virginia side, which is eight counties, and it looks a lot bigger, actually have pretty close to the same population. Maryland grew sooner, faster, because it actually had better connectivity to the District of Columbia where the good jobs were. You didn't have to go across the river. You, see, and, and you had good roads extending mainly into Montgomery County, but, well, there's really good roads that extend into uh, Prince George's County, too, but the, the, the growth, the early growth was towards Montgomery County and Frederick. And more recently, Northern Virginia has picked up. There's about a 10 percent difference 12. Not a big difference. Look at the job difference, though. So where the people live and where the work is done has re is really different. The, 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 people, the people is where you live. This is where you work. So the, re the geography is a little different. But look at what's happened over this 30-year period. they both grown, but they're not growing anywhere near at the same rate. Northern Virginia has generated far more jobs, more than double, than all the others combined. Well, answer, well, there's an answer to that. There's also another shift that's going on that actually is a part of the answer, is that who we work for and possibly what we do has changed over this time. Back in 1950, you had just under 38 percent of the workforce working for the federal government. These are the people who are not working today, well, most of them. <clears throat> and, and services were, were professional business services, but that also included financial services, and retail isn't in that. Um, so it's, it's sort of the, the office kind of users, generally. And you can see the switch there, that it looks almost as if we have become less dependent on the federal government. What you see isn't what's happening, of course, because since 1980, We've, we've gone from, from $4.2 4 billion in federal contracting in the Washington area to $85 billion. And that's all done in the private sector. So uh, if you add those two numbers together on both sides, <coughs> they're actually the totality of what we do, services and federal, then and now as a percentage of all the jobs isn't very different. It's just that, that they work differently. They work in the private sector as opposed to the public sector. We're still 12 percent, 12.1, something like that, today. I just, uh, if I take this out to 13, to August of 13, it's 12.1 percent federal, uh, 371,000 federal workers. <clears throat> now this, this is, this is, goes with that jobs piece. You know, all jobs aren't equal, so when we look at jobs, just like all people aren't equal, they have different educational levels, different ages, Jobs have different wages. They work in different sectors. And so there's a danger in just saying, how many new jobs do we have? It's really, what kind of new jobs do we have? But if we look at what's happened in Northern Virginia, so this intersection up here is 1983. And that, <coughs> that was 
you know, shortly after Reagan became president, but it was, more importantly, it was, at, it was the very beginning, the very beginning of federal outsourcing of federal activity, uh, federal contracting. And <clears throat> then you can see how this has gone. Um, all I'm going to say here to save time for this moment is that Northern Virginia has, re businesses in Northern Virginia has re have received more than half of all the federal contracts led over this period. And so this growth that goes with that, you know, it's, it's the correlation between federal contracting and economic growth is almost one to one. It's point nine, the R square is, is 0.95. It's basically a, a straight line connection. And suburban Maryland and District of Columbia have split the other, it's 49%, something in that order, say 50. They've split it, but it's different. In DC, it's the contracting rents space for people to work. It's oriented towards support of the workforce the federal workforce, so it's human resource related, health related, training. It's, it's a different kind of contracting mix. It has different kinds of contractors where Maryland is, is uh, a little more, more like, like Northern Virginia, except it's on the more health related. They, the folks over in suburban Maryland like to say that, that they specialize in the life sciences and Northern Virginia specializes in the death sciences. DOD, of course, has driven this, but DOD is only 45% of all of the federal contracting data, so it isn't the only story, but it's, it's cute, death sciences and life sciences. So let's look at federal spending. Well, I've told you this already, but let me show you it. So <clears throat> I'm starting in 85. I don't know why I didn't. I guess the chart was too long, so, but it, the story really starts in 1980. But, but you can see this, this orange bar here getting bigger and bigger, and it goes up to, to this should be, this should be 85, um, 82, excuse me, 82.5 billion. That's the peak. It's come down every year since then. Well, not, there are not too many years since then, but that, it's interesting to you know that's the peak. So if you want to say, you know, when did it start changing? Maybe that's when it is. But the other thing is there's other kinds of federal spending going on here. We've got payroll. We have, we have retirement and disability. We have a bunch of social services in here, too, that, uh, and, and some, some loans, like SBA loans, and, and some, um, uh, hmm, what else is in there? Oh, grants, so, so education, and some things that aren't really contracting, uh, and, and some transportation. But the, the ratio here, this is 20% this is of the total. That's half. So the mix change, the one thing that's different about the Washington area than any other metropolitan area, if you want to point to one difference, is that we got a lot of federal contracting. Nobody has this dominance. We get 15 cents of every dollar spent by the federal government on buying goods and services anywhere in the world. If you're running a business and you have 15% of the market, you should be doing pretty well. It's an enormous amount. <coughs> that total bar, by the way, is 160, 169 billion. And this is 82.5, so you know, roughly half. <clears throat> this is what's interesting, too. Another way to look at this, and the, the federal procurement spending was less than the federal wages up to 1995, 1996, that, that period. The period of the, the last long shutdown of the federal government. It has nothing to do with it, but it just coincides. <clears throat> so so uh, here's the federal payroll, and here's procurement. It's double now. But just think of the kind of workers that are associated with this, and then think about where can they work. The guys, the people in that green line can work in a dispersed location. They can be in Tyson's, they can be, you know, at a little intersection somewhere out on the interstate highway in Loudoun County. They can be everywhere where these folks tend to be much more concentrated. More than half of them in the District of Columbia, most of them inside the Beltway. So it's a, you begin to get a different land use pattern associated with these spending patterns, and this is a, the principal factor driving growth in the Washington area. So this is procurement. It's the one thing that's really different. You can see that through 10, from 80 to 10, it, it's uh, pretty substantial. This, we move from, from 4.2 to 12.7 to 29.3 to 82.5. Now, if your checkbook was growing that fast, you wouldn't have to be here tonight. You'd be, you'd be on some island. N Northern Virginia got half of this. Northern, the businesses in Northern Virginia got half of them. Why are those businesses in Northern Virginia rather than the district? 
So it isn't Virginia, per se, or Maryland, or, or D.C. It's where the businesses chose to locate. There's no, these contracts are competitive. They're not, they're not politically directed. These companies came to Washington to do this work because their competitors were. None of these companies doing this work probably, except maybe Lockheed Martin, I don't know when they moved to Washington but, or when they started, but they were, they were already here, let's say. Almost all of these contractors moved here from somewhere else. And then they chose where to locate. And they chose where to locate in Virginia. Virginia gets half of that. I might add that this piece here is two-thirds of the total. And so if you're thinking of bubbles or, 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 or factors that have influenced things more recently, two-thirds of all of that money, two-thirds of that almost $900 billion was spent in the last 10 years. So <clears throat> this is the federal workforce. It goes up and down. Now, it really hasn't changed much since, since poor Nixon Ford administration, you know, or, or the Carter man. This, this is 1980. So all that procurement, basically, that was going on was holding the workforce steady. GDP in this country is maybe four times as high as it was in 1980. I don't know exactly the number. But we have the same number of federal workers. Either they're really smart and working with really great technology or they have help. And they've outsourced a lot of work to the point, and as I say, this, this is running, well, today there's, there's 371,000 federal workers. Today, August, that would be. And, and we have maybe 500,000 federal contractors. So they outnumber the federal workers. Now, it isn't as if the federal workforce hasn't gotten big. It's just that they're hidden, they're disguised, they're in the private sector. So this is the economy that, we, that we're starting from in, 19, in 2010. Procurement is 19 percent. Oh, that, that circle, if you're interested, is, is uh, 425 billion. So every percent on that is worth four and a quarter, four, say four billion. Let's just keep it simple. So here's 19 percent of it. Wages was, was uh, 10 percent. That was 42 billion. It's not today 42 billion, but that's what it was. All that other stuff is sort of tied to inflation and to population, won't change much. This is where most of us are. We, we're not working for the federal government, but, well, maybe some of you are, but, but uh, <coughs> the, all the spending that's going on in the rest of this place helps support us. So this is where your bankers would be, unless they're international bankers. This is where your, your church would be. This is where your school teachers are. This is where the building industry is, uh, as long as they're building for local consumption. Uh, hospitality, you know, gets a lot of play. It's not unimportant, but it's only... Well, 2%, 2.5% of 44, $425 billion is a lot of money. It's only $10 billion or so. It's not unimportant. But that's the first question. With the shutdown and the monuments and museums closed, what's it doing to tourism? Well, it's hurting it. But it isn't going to drive the economy. It's that $42 billion up there is, in payroll is t four times as big as this. Now, I would add that, that you and I have more impact on hospitality than the people that visit it because we're eating out all the time. And I didn't, I put them, I put us, all our eating out and our going to movies and theater and doing stuff, I put them over there because it isn't really an export activity. International business, associations, health and education becoming very important and some stuff that I just didn't, couldn't figure out what to do with. The, the piece, though, that is the missing piece, the important piece, is non-local business. These are people who come here but don't have to do their business here. They have a regional market. They could be anywhere, but they've come here because this is a good place to do business. Now, it may be that they can get information faster or get really good workers. That used to be 14% before the recession, and it's gotten smaller. I have to move. <clears throat> so, so let's see. Very quickly, we went through, I'm, you, I'm setting you up for how we're going to look forward. We went through an enormous change. The whole country did. We lost a bundle of jobs during the recession. The reporter called me up today and said, you know, the Washington area used to be considered re recession-proof. I wish I could have kicked him, because I've been telling people for 30 years that we never were recession-proof. We've always had recessions. They're just not as bad here as other places. So we're cushioned. And, but we, we still lost 193,000 jobs. Those were people that used to work in those areas. Look at construction. 
Well, that shouldn't be surprising. We build enough houses, extra houses, for five years. And now we don't have anybody to build houses anymore. You can't get a carpenter or a plumber or an electrician, and we need them. The forecast is for 55,000 new construction workers in the next five years, and they're not here. They left. They got old. We've added a few back. <coughs> uh, and this is, this is only through the end of last year. And so, so uh, you can see what we've added. In the industry, health and education didn't lose jobs at all. Think about the population. We have 73 million people who are baby boomers, and then there's a whole bunch of people older than the baby boomers. And we have about 75 million who are between the age of 15 and 34, or Gen Y, whatever that group actually is. It has different boundaries to it. And then Generation X in between is a smaller. We've got a lot of young people need to go to school. We've got a lot of old, old people need health care. Can't go wrong. So if you want to learn, if you want to take up a planning specialty, plan for old people. There's a whole bunch of them, and they need some help. <laughs> so the professional business services, those are the people that fill up the office buildings. They're not growing. These are in order, by the way, of importance, not importance, in, in number. So professional business services has 700,000 jobs in it. That's out of 3 million. That's a really big, this has about 70. So these are stacked inversely. And the two most important, I, and there's no public sector on here because they, they actually added jobs during the recession. Now they're losing jobs. But if you add, federal is the second largest after uh, professional business services together. They're, they're a million, one hundred thousand. They're a third of all of our jobs. And they also have the best pay. They average six figures, just barely six figures. They both stopped growing. We're not adding any jobs to speak of in those sectors today. We used to be the fastest growing metropolitan area in the country between 2000 and 2010. Last year, or in this period between as the economy began to recover nationwide, we dropped, we didn't grow, we, we added 57,000 jobs, but we didn't grow like some of the other places. Most of these places outperforming us are smaller than we are, so the, on a standardized basis it's, it's, it's um, even bigger, Dallas has passed us now. They used to be fifth, and we were fourth in the number of jobs. We're still fourth in the number of, in, in value of those jobs, because we have better jobs. But they've passed us now in the total number of jobs last uh, November. And Houston's breathing down our back. Those, those guys are just growing topsy-turvy. They have very diversified economies. It's not petrochemicals, as you might think immediately. Like, they have a lot of other stuff going. What's interesting, just so I want to sensitize you to this, because the kinds of job growth that we were used to, I just picked five years before the recession, had a really big imbalance between high paying jobs, and I just picked one sector, and a, another sector, which happens to be the health and, uh, where is it, health and education, or education and health, sector didn't lose any jobs at all. This is a, this is a very hot sector, but in terms of growth, during that period, not so fast. Since, since the recession, they turned the tables. But look at the salary differences between those two sectors. You have to create two jobs in health and education to equal the income of one job in professional business services. We have a really big shift going on in the economy, which is going to affect what kind of cars people buy, what kind of houses they can afford, what, how big a house they can afford. And the shift is being precipitated partly by shifting the kinds of jobs we grow, but we're also retiring older people at an increasing rate because we have a lot of older people through th because of all the baby boomers, and we're replacing with younger people, and they don't start at the same pay scale as the older people who are leaving the workforce. So we have a double shift going on that's going to lower the, the, the wage rates. Look what happened in 11. This data for 12 aren't out yet, and I guess they'll never come out unless we get people back to work. But we actually had a decline in the average wage. And that's because of this changing job mix. So, so there's some, there's some sub-stories here. Let's, let's, so you've already seen that picture. That's what happened in, in 11. We had a slight decrease in federal contracting. That was because of the requirements of the Budget Control Act of 2011, which included a 50 
a $50 billion annual reduction in defense spending for 10 years. So that's all, that, that had nothing to do with the fiscal cliff. That's already underway. And it, it, it cut into us just a little bit. That's what happened in 12. So we're already down, um, the, the, the top bar is 82.5. So we're already down over, over almost uh, $7 billion. If you want to know what happens as a result of the sequester, we can always look because it already happened. It, these, the companies that did this work in eight, they knew this was coming because Iraq was done, Afghanistan was winding down. Uh, the, this, big ramp, this big ramp up here is, is a lot of homeland security and security related activities. And they saw this coming. They started re repositioning their workforce. So companies that were federal contractors were f beginning to look for other kinds of work. So the federal contractor who's sitting there in his shorts and his short sleeve shirt and his flip flops working on his computer is still doing it. But he's not a federal worker anymore. He's working for somebody else. Really hard to know what the impacts are. We didn't lose all these people, but we, we can see the change happening. Look at federal workers. We've lost federal jobs for 26 consecutive months. There's an oddball month in there. I don't know what that is. <coughs> but, you know, th th this, you know this, this, is, this is quite, it's over 13,000 jobs, and these aren't layoffs. These are retirements and normal turnover, jobs left vacant. And why would you do that? Well, if you don't know how much payroll you have to give back because of the sequester, you do just like your private business uh, colleagues, you'd leave jobs empty. You have the payroll, you can give it back. So don't spend your money. And that's, that is why the sequester hasn't felt so hard, so badly. So you can read very quickly some of the impacts that have already happened. Um, I won't read that to you. but So we can look back and we can already see some of the impacts going into this year. Let's look at what's happening right now. So here we are in August, the most recently available data. We are still adding jobs. If I'd showed you this for July, we were up 50,500 for the year ending in July. Now we're only up 33,400. So we're not, we're losing some growth. This is always measured against the same month the year before. But look at, look at Dallas. Dallas is uh, booming. Has fewer, well, we have fewer people than Dallas. Uh, Houston uh, is, but we're bigger than Boston. We're bigger than Atlanta. We're only Detroit is doing worse than we are in, a, in, in San Francisco, which is a relatively tiny. These are the 15 largest metro areas. And, and this is our 30. So what kind of jobs? Well, forget these. Remember, these, these are in, in, uh, in rank order. There's about 70,000 jobs. The top one's 700,000. <coughs> We're losing jobs in the federal government. Well, you know, that seems reasonable. We're losing jobs in construction. What that is, you gotta always have to think about. Now, what happened last August? We had the Silver Line under construction. We still had a lot of workers on the express lanes in, in Northern Virginia. They're gone right now. They're gonna come back in various ways. And, and the residential market is heating up. So, so that's a temporary condition. This is information services. This is the Washington Post or Channel 7. It's not information technology. Um, manufacturing, I don't know why we have any jobs left, but because uh, that's wholesale trade if you can't, can't figure it out. And this is transportation, and this is Dulles Airport and that kind of stuff. So the bottom end of our economy isn't doing too well. This is all real estate agents. That the growth is real estate agents doing, doing a lot of work. Uh, other services are dog walking services, tattoo parlors, beauty shops, things, you know, personal services. They're starting to grow. So we have a lot of our economy that's doing nothing or, or is very specialized, and then some thing, leisure and hospitality. What is that? You guys have to learn how to cook. You know, the people are going out and eating and having a good time. That's not people coming from Kansas. That's us. Retail trade, it looks pretty positive. We're starting to spend money. State and local government is actually backfilling jobs that have been vacated in previous years. They're not up to their historic totals yet. Education and health service still growing. The jobs that generate over $100,000 on average per job, professional business services, and fill in all these office buildings we keep building, aren't growing. And then the ones we do have are taking less space. So that's not a good thing. That's our most important sector, and it's not growing. Look what happened last month. I showed you for the year. 
The last month of that year, August, we lost 26,500 jobs. The Post won't report this. I've given them all this stuff. This isn't a story. Well, it's a story to me. Nothing grew. Not one sector grew. D.C., well, let me show you the rest of this. There's D.C. The state and local, you can forget that. That's, that's an accounting. They, they report teachers who are on nine-year contracts as unemployed, or they lose it, or they subtract their jobs. So just take that out. But look, look at the column here. There's nothing happening. The economy is standing still, waiting for direction, waiting to know whether we're going to have a layoffs or a closure, waiting to see if we're going to have a budget or whether we're going to deal with the debt ceiling. There's a lot of stuff coming yet over this month and, and, and on into next year. There's nothing happening. There's not much happening in Maryland either, is there? Or in Northern Virginia. The whole economy just ground to a halt. In July, you could see this. There was a little positive stuff, but not much. And so we have a year of growth that now we're, the, the last couple of months of that 12-month period are zeros or less. And so it's eroding. And as I said, we had 50,000 jobs total for the year, for the J July to July, August to August. We only have 33. So we're losing ground. Unemployment, well, that's still pretty good. It's inching up a little bit. We're not going to get any reports this week. We were supposed to get unemployment reports for August this week and, and national employment on Friday, but there's none. So, so this is the forecast. I just have a couple more if you stick with me. We do expect growth. We expect this year to be slower than the rest of, of uh, uh, the, you know, last year or next year. We expect the economy to pick up. And we're also expecting federal dollars to continue declining or slowly eroding as a percentage of, of gross regional product until we get to about 16 and it stabilizes. And there's it, not all sources start growing again, but, but there is the, the social side of the federal budget. Uh, begins to, to grow for us, and procurement continues to decline uh, and stabilizes more or less over this five-year period. This is what's interesting. If you want to take your, I know time is short, but if you want to take a couple of ideas as you think about the rest of the lectures, we project that we're going to have some pretty good growth over this five-year period, that we're going to add some jobs. And these are the jobs that we always talk about. How many new jobs are we going to get? Well, it's, it's, it's okay. We want to know what kind of jobs they are, of course. But what nobody talks about or has measured is how many new workers do we need to fill the jobs that people are leaving behind because they're retiring or they just get tired of the traffic here and go back home to Kansas. It's an enormous number. It's a number that's bigger than the net. These, these two numbers, add them together, it's something like 815,000 jobs. They are all to be filled by people who aren't working today. They're not working here today. They could be here, but they're not working. So some of them could be unemployed people. We don't have enough to fill that. They could be people who move here. They certainly will. They could be people who come here to college and stay from somewhere else and stay. That's their major source. They could be people who are sitting home knitting or be taking care of their children or doing something useful but not working who decide to come back into the workforce. We really are going to have to really look hard. Five years isn't. And you can see what the natural population, this is the population forecast from, uh, this is the residential, oh, excuse me, this is the population that's age 18 to 64. And this, this is uh, from the census. So this is, this is how many people that we can draw from, expected. And it's not enough to fill 815,000 jobs. So we have a labor shortage. We have a housing shortage. That's why housing prices are high. And so we need more housing in order to accommodate more workers to fill the jobs so our economy can grow. And if you don't have more workers, you can't grow the economy. So that's a major challenge. These, just take a quick look. These are where those openings are. There. It's, it adds up to eight, 841. I didn't do my math right. Uh, I didn't remember. But these are what kind of jobs we're projected to add. These are new forecasts. I buy these. So they're not mine, but you know, people who, who look at this, and they, but they're, they're, they're August forecast. Sales, 100,000 people. Well, that's a job that turns over, and it could be a part, these could be, some of these could be part-time jobs, by the way. Uh, they certainly be self-employment. But if you just look across that very quickly, you say, man, we need some really smart people. We need some people with some special skills, because this is where your, your, your 
um, well, this is where your, your beauty parlor at attendant might come from or, your, or the person at, uh, you in the cleaners. You know, they need to know how to do something. Uh, health care is a really big area. The biggest thing, there's 32 categories in health care. The biggest, fastest growing is home health care aid. Probably pays the minimum wage, whatever that is. It's, but it isn't something that anybody in this room would probably want to have to do except maybe for their, their, their best, closest friend, mother maybe. But you wouldn't want to have to do it for more than a week. It's an awful job. And who's going to know where all the, these, these aren't doctors by and large. These are lower end. And, but look up and down, food preparation. These jobs require a whole lot of different kinds of people. These are the net new jobs. It's a little different mix. You can distribute this to any, to you, or put it up on your website if you want, if people are interested in it. But this is the last, the last point. Look at the educational requirements. Less than a third of all of the jobs require college education. We're training, we're tra educating everybody. And it's a good thing. I want my kids to go to college. Everybody wants to have a college education in graduate school. But what we need is a whole bunch of people that know how to do things. Plumbers, electricians, they can make really good living. They're no vocational schools, basically. There's no emphasis on, on skills training in this country, or in our, certainly in our region. So we, we even affect are building a, a labor shortage, and we haven't addressed it. This is the economy. I think this is my last slide. Uh, this is the economy that we're looking for in five years. Remember, the other one had 39% of the economy was federal, and now it's, it's going to have dropped to 29%. The economy is much bigger, so it's still a pretty big number. The federal base is still $165 billion. It's nothing to sneeze at. It is our foundation. And now what's going to build off of it is non-local business goes from 12 to 16. We're going to get more people coming here to Tyson's, to, da to, to city center, to places, because this is the center of, of the, the globe. It's, it's a really important business center in the world. New York still will be really important. We won't bring all of those guys here, but they will have offices here. This grows from 34 to 38. Why? Because our fastest growing sector is going to be construction during this period. Housing construction, single family, there's such pent up demand, that's a whole other lecture. Health gets bigger because we have more old people and young people and, and uh, has nothing to do with Obamacare. Uh, hospitality a little bit bigger and a, tiny, a little, little tiny bit bigger. Primarily, we get less dependent, slightly less dependent on federal, on the fe on federal spending and we get more dependent on, on um, Normal businesses, businesses that have a, a global and national and regional reach. So this is where I leave you with some of the issues that you might want to be thinking about. Uh, these are all really big problems. I've run over five minutes. You've been good not to get up and leave. Uh, but I know some of you have classes here soon. I'm happy to take a question or two. Uh, I will, I will, as you look at that, I'm going to switch this to our website. We put all of this kind of stuff up on our website at the Center for Regional Analysis. It's all free. There's lots of research. It's a really big topic. And, and the, um, the effects of the sequester, by the way, are going to accelerate because what wasn't funded for federal contracts were for work to be done next year. Well, we are in next year, in fiscal 13 and 14 and in calendar 14. So a lot of the effects of less contracting, about $5 billion this year in less federal contracting after a $4.5 billion decrease last year, is less work. But it hasn't happened yet. It's just beginning to show up. We have a $2 billion reduction in the federal payroll over the last 12 months. That's, well, the federal workforce is getting smaller. It's going to lose another seven, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 jobs this next year, 17,000 over five. And then it sort of stabilizes is what the expectation is. So uh, we are becoming less dependent, but we need workers to do the work because we're building an economy that needs different kinds of skills. And the, it's, we need warehouse workers and transportation workers, and that hasn't been our, our strength in the past. So if you want to go to that website, uh, any, any time, we keep putting stuff up there, some interesting uh, working papers. It's all free. So thank you very much. You, you're the timekeeper. I'm happy to take a question. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, if folks have a couple of quick clarification questions, please uh, raise your hand. Yes. Uh, 
Um, one thing that is discussed a lot in D.C. is the growth of the, the tax sector, the, you know, incubators and, and that sort of thing. And I also, you know, talk amongst my friends about the fact that because we do have such a highly educated professional workforce here, even if people lose jobs, people oftentimes will start their own consulting businesses on the side, which they may keep as they get other jobs or may possibly expand into something, something larger. And I'm wondering between those two types of, of job sectors, is that something that is starting to show up in the data you have or is it reflected anywhere or is it still such a small portion, proportion of the economy? Good, good questions. The, uh, this is complicating the answer is the word tech because tech used to be something special and now we all are using technology and it's sort of like the telephone was really special in 1895 but it, but today everybody uses one and it doesn't look like it used to either um, so I think uh, tech has some opportunities I, I don't think there's there there's a few winners in this Facebook you know. <laughs> there are a few there are a few winners and it's possible that we can generate some business. I don't think that's the driver of our economy, but we have that potential, and so I wouldn't want to discourage it. It does need some capital support behind it and sometimes some subsidy. What, what this region has been very good at and is very difficult to measure, all of these are, are too hard to measure because they don't ask you, they, they say, are you a are you a pharmaceutical company? Are you a manufacturing? They don't ask if you're, you're, you're a tech innovator a uh, social media person. You know, I mean, that isn't the classifications yet. Maybe we need to change the, the way we measure things. But with the strength of what people can do, and, and we have this clearly evident in the Washington area, educated professionals can take what they know and pack it, repackage it and sell it to other people. And so the, the, typically we see this federal employees they, they, they work for 30 years or 25, 30 years. They ha they're 55 years old. They have a pension. And they say, I, I know a lot. I know about project management. I can help people work with the federal government, or I can help people with their, their federal contracting management. And so they put themselves out there as a consultant. You need a computer. They used to cost $5,000. They don't cost that much anymore. You need a, maybe an iPad. Uh, you need a car. You don't. You don't need an office. You can do this out of the front seat of your car. You can, you can start a business on a credit card, or on a little bit of savings, or you know, ask your spouse for a loan. And so w we have this capacity, and it's probably some of it's in this room. I teach. I consult. I give lectures. I can earn money all sorts of different ways. I can do it here. I mean, we're a mobile society, and it's because we're educated. You have to think a little differently. You have to be a little more of a salesperson, a little more extroverted than I may want to be at times. Uh, you have to put yourself out there. You have to think about how you package what you know. But Washington is just full of people that do this. And you, military officers, I mean, there's some traditional ones. Insurance, salesmen, I mean, they, they know a lot of things. Car dealers, they can, become, they can sell other things and actually reinvent themselves. And we do it all the time. And we're going to need to do it because we're going to have to work until we're 75 or 80. We're living until 90 or 100, and we don't have any savings, or not enough. And so we're going to have to find ways to work differently. And this is a strength of our economy. Yes? Many of the problems of the region that you highlighted like traffic congestion or um, uh, inability to have enough non-highly educated workers to repair air conditioning and do all the rest of the things are caused by or at least substantially exacerbated by the lack of affordable housing close in. Um, Anywhere, it's, really, but you're right. You're right. Well, as opposed to drive till you qualify to mm -hmm. West Virginia or yes. someplace else. Um, it's somewhat surprising that the major regional business uh, organizations tend to focus on the we need to build more highways uh, solution. <coughs> and even in places like COG, the initial <coughs> estimates or the initial plans that come out of the jurisdictions tend to focus on creating more commercial space yep. Yep. and less residential space and figure that that responsibility to house the <coughs> workforce gets pushed off on somebody else. So as a region, 
what kinds of policies or activities <coughs> can we engage in that could help redress that balance and well, begin you, to you, solve you've, these problems? You've hit the biggest problem right on the head. Uh, there is a report on this website called Housing the Region's Future Workforce. It was done a couple years ago, and it, and it focuses on just the new workers, not the replacement workers, because it was just too big. Nobody would have believed us. We just took the new workers, who they were, what their household structure was, what, uh, and what their, what their incomes were going to be, and what kind of housing they could afford, and we assumed we made two assumptions. One, that, that all new workers working in any county would live there. How many houses would you have to have and what price ranges and how many would be rental versus owner? And then we assumed that, that, that the, the current commuting patterns were preserved, that it, we wouldn't have more in and out commuting. We'd have, if, if Montgomery County had 45, or let's say 50 percent of their, their residents commuting out to work. We wouldn't increase that percentage as they grew, so they had to accommodate at the same proportion as they have in the past. And the numbers are just unbelievable. We need, at, at, if we're going to maintain the percentage, which is increasing congestion, because it's increasing the numbers, but it's proportional, we need 35,000 housing units a year. We're no, of, of any kind, we're nowhere near that. If you're going to actually house everybody in their county and, and not have any, inc and actually accommodate all of the, that means there's no in commuting from Baltimore. We, everybody that works in Montgomery County lives in, Baltimore, in, in Montgomery County, and so 72,000 housing units a year. We've never built more than 35, ever. And so we have a major problem, and so the message is, and the message is, is to COG or to all the planning agencies and to builders and to all the regulators, we need to think about how we get more housing on the land we have. And it has to be cheaper and it has to have an increasing percentage of renter, rental housing. Not at $2,000 a unit, but, and, you know, the, and we have to think about all of the costs that are imposed on housing by regulation. We, 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 there's a, a study there, we did it for every jurisdiction, but we, re, we, we drilled down on Montgomery County and Fairfax, just to have one on either side of the river, more or less equal counties, similar counties. But the amount of cost that goes on to every unit that might be just a convenience, you know, where you don't get any value added for it. If, you, if it's a sewer hookup, well, yeah, you're getting sewer. But if it's just a development fee because you're an easy target. The one number I can remember, in, in Fauquier County, it's $60 $60,000 for a single-family house is publicly generated costs. Well, clearly, I mean, th this is, these aren't voters. These are just, these are, these are easy targets. Well, how do you provide affordable housing when you tack on a lot of extra costs? So we, we need to think about it across the board. And I would argue with anybody that w don't think about tax subsidies or, or, or um, whatever other kind of inducement public sector might offer uh, business to locate, the businesses are going to come where the workforce is. In the future, the businesses are going to look around for a qualified workforce, and to have a qualified workforce, you're going to have to have housing. Housing should be the number one requirement or the number one tool in economic development. It, it, it get economic development agencies to talk about housing as the container, as the capacity builder for business investment. There are four million unfilled jobs in the United States today. With an unemployment rate of 7.3 percent, there are four million unfilled jobs. What's the problem? We have workers who aren't qualified. They're also increasingly in the wrong lo location. They can't afford to move to where the jobs are. It's going to be six million by, two, by 2018. That's what the Department of Labor said before they shut down. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be six million vacant jobs. There's not enough workers to go around. I've already pointed out there's not enough workers here. We have to get them from somewhere else. If they go to Raleigh, the jobs are going to Raleigh. The jobs and the business investment are following the workers. Housing is how you get the workers. And if we had more housing, it would be less expensive. Housing is expensive in Washington because there's a supply shortage. It's, it is Econ 101. We had more housing. I don't want my house to get less expensive. So you do this after I leave, but, but we need more housing, and we need housing size to people. We don't need 4,000 square foot for a couple. 
Even though some people can afford it and like it, we need to think about housing as a much smaller and we need to stack it higher. So, you know, talks about height, raising the height limits, it ought to be on housing too. And we, we need more housing and it's going to be different. It won't be on half acre or quarter acre lots. You know, there'd be some of that. We'd probably have enough of it if we actually thought about it. And we need more rental housing. It's an interesting study. We're updating all of these. And I'll tell you, let me, let me take one more minute because something's going to happen this fall which I'm really, I'm proud of but I'm also excited about. I have managed to get the Council of Governments, the Board of Trade, the Federal City Council, the Urban Land Institute, the Washington chapter, and the 2030 group which is a group of rich people, not very many of them, who are really interested in long-range regional thinking. That's, that's their mantra. I've gotten them to put up some money to study this housing problem that you raised and also to revise the forecasts and we've, they're all coming around to sit around the table, public sector, private sector, to talk about these problems that I've shared with you today, primarily workforce and housing. Because those, if you put workforce and housing together, you don't have to worry about the economy. It takes care of itself. And there's plenty of money for everybody. The investment flows to where the workers are. And we have the capacity to do this. We have the assets, but we don't have the land use and zoning that we have here isn't attuned to this. The business community isn't attuned to it. We, gotta, we have work to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Join me. Thank you, Steve. That's great. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic first start. Uh, we're celebrating the start of the speaker series with a reception upstairs. Please join me upstairs uh, to, to uh, enjoy a, a little bit of food and drink. Thank you so much for coming today.